Cool. Uh, okay, I think we might uh, kick off. We have uh, a, a growing crowd. We might have a few stragglers. Uh, but first of all, welcome to our uh, first event of Design and Violence. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Um, we are going to have a discussion uh, amongst the curators, and I'm very honored to be amongst such esteemed curators. Uh, but we'll keep the introductions short so we can get straight into questions, a discussion. And then it'll open up to you. Uh, hopefully, you've had some time to see the exhibition. But if you haven't, catch it afterwards. We're open till 8 PM uh, every weekday except for Monday, and then 12 to 6 on the weekends. Uh, so, um, without further ado, I'll just introduce our curators. Uh, am I right? We have Lynn Scarf, uh, Director of Science Gallery. We have Ralph Borland, who is uh, one of the researcher and curator on this show, but previously worked with us on surface tension, amongst other things. Uh, Paolo Antonelli from uh, MoMA in New York, and Jamer Hunt uh, from New School in New York. Um, to kick off, though, uh, Paula and Jamer are going to give us a little bit of a context and show some of the images that kind of uh, uh, give the background and also describe the sort of inception of design and violence. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. It's uh, really a delight to be back here. I think I was on this stage about six or seven years ago presenting Design and the Elastic Mind, and it's just wonderful to be back here. And uh, just a little bit of background about design and violence. You see here this amazing exhibition. It has wonderful artifacts. It has, it makes sense. It has strong circulation. It has very, very incisive experiences that will stay with you your whole life. Well, that's what Jamer and I dreamt of having about four years ago when we were prompted to do this project. This project was prompted by um, two events that happened in our life. One is the, the release of the 3D printed gun that I'm sure you're all familiar with. It was Cody Wilson, who's a great uh, libertarian crypto anarchist from Texas. And I say great because he's really quite an impressive human being, whether you agree with him or not. Um, Cody released this gun files, the gun is called the Liberator, and he released the files open source for everyone to use and download and for everyone to be able to print a lethal weapon in their home if they could afford a medium range 3D printer. So it was really stunning to have something normally used for good purposes, at, at least in our minds, you know, design and open source, transform itself into this kind of perverse um, ultimate freedom of uh, having the freedom to build an instrument to kill. And so that was kind of a shock to the system for two design critics that are used to believing that design is all for the good of humanity and that everything happens for the betterment of society. Not really, it can go wrong. The second event was the publication of this book by Steven Pinker, who's an amazing scholar from Harvard, that was called The Better Angels of Our Nature that it argues, it's a huge tome, it argues with like serious data and scholarly research that our society is becoming less and less violent. That gave us a lot of perplexity and the reason for that perplexity no. I have no idea what that's. Oh, like. it's oh. when you were talking about <laughs> when you were talking about how war had changed and the oh, asymmetrical yeah. okay, warfare. Great. Of course, <laughs> um, as this slide demonstrates, um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that was a particular fascination in um, in bringing this together was that we were really seeing um, what I would almost describe as a kind of tectonic shift within warfare, um, and this was a move from you know sort of the the battlefield. Uh, nation versus nation, state versus state, territorial warfare, um, to one that was really changing to asymmetrical warfare, for instance. Um, so something like the United States going to war um, in a kind of uh, what at one point was described as a perpetual war against terrorist organizations, many of whom were adopting forms that were more uh, network-like um, than they were hierarchical in the traditional sense of a of a sort of nation state or a rogue nation. Um, so this, this was an interesting change on the one hand, this kind of asymmetry. Um, and also that war was shifting, um, particularly in the effort after 9-11, and we really oriented this exhibition starting from uh, that date in um, 2001. There was a shift towards uh, counterinsurgency as a sort of new kind of modality of warfare. Um, and, it was putting soldiers who traditionally you know, were in uh, the role of kind of overpowering um, the enemy into uh, roles that were almost like anthropologists. Uh, how do you win over 
through other means um, the people that you're trying to uh, convince. So it was a fascinating moment for exploring this really shifting notion of even how warfare was taking form. Not to mention the fact that more and more non-lethal weapons were being developed. So we felt that, if anything, our society was becoming not less violent, but more violent in different ways, including the violence of uh, wrongly placed sarcasm. You know, <laughs> this is uh, uh, you know this is what design uh, does sometimes. You know, this Philippe Stark uh, released this AK-47 and Beretta-inspired lamps. Well. Granted, it was several years ago, 15, but nonetheless, it was an act of extreme cynicism that prompted us to really look at online bullying, to look at digital warfare, to look at asymmetrical warfare, to try and understand <laughs> violence at a much wider, with a much wider range, and sometimes also to burn our old idea of design, as you can see here in this burning chair by Alessandro Mendini, and to evolve our thinking about design. Uh, so Jamer brought up this beautiful quote by Victor Papanek. I'm sure that all of you here who know about design are familiar with this book, Design for the Real World from 1971, which was possibly one of the first books that realized and that uh, kind of provoked the world to believe that design is not only for the 1%, but that it is a force for social good when it really percolates down to the whole world. And this quote is amazing. It says, there are professions more harmful than industrial design, but only a very few of them. So taking our steps from all these different realizations, we um, try to look at design and to look at what design had been in the past. Upstairs in the exhibition, you will find an amazing video <laughs> from the 1950s. You see here George Nelson. How cute is he? And he did the marshmallow <laughs> sofa, and he did this wonderful <laughs> clocks, and he did the coconut chair. All cute and just like uh, optimistic 1950s. Well, he is the author of How to Kill People, which is a book and a video upstairs that he uh, actually performed on CBS in the 1950s, in which he took killing as an act of design. So, in a way, George Nelson is the perfect Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of design. What we think can do good can also go the other way. So Jimmer and I started looking at objects that have an ambiguous relationship with design. We started looking at design with clarity and without being so idealistic. And we decided to, first of all, uh, now, um, describe violence in very wide terms as the power to alter circumstances against the will of other or to their detriment. So any kind of violence, not only physical one. And then we started thinking at all these different categories that are almost uh, instinctual when you think of violence. We will not go into too much detail, but what happened is that we presented the Museum of Modern Art with a proposal for an exhibition. The museum decided that as an exhibition it was not really viable, so they said no, and I can tell you we, you get a lot of rejection in our line of work, <laughs> right? Also self-rejection yes. sometimes. Yes. And um, so Jamer and I thought that it was too important an idea. Sometimes when you get a rejection you just shelve the idea, but in this case we really wanted to go ahead, so if you want to. Yeah, so we were, we were trying to think of how we could take this idea, this almost a platform for thinking through a variety of really complex issues and, and issues that we felt were not, um, you know, were, were meant to draw the audience into a conversation. Um, they really were uh, not, it's not an instance of us trying to sit here in judgment of designers. I think that's one of the things that was really important to both of us is we didn't want to judge designers as either violent or nonviolent. What we wanted to do was introduce <laughs> sort of problems and examples into the conversation so that the design community could actually think more seriously about the repercussions and the implications of the work that they do. So it then made sense to us to think about moving this exhibition idea online. Um, one of the things, one of the affordances, one of the possibilities of moving it online is you then can allow for two-way communication. Um, online two-way communication is not always pretty. Um, <laughs> And so we had a lot of conversations about how to actually manage that because we had some very sensitive topics we wanted to um, engage with and, and we didn't want to just set up a platform that was going to become a target for trolls and others um, who were just going to bring the whole thing down. But we managed to put together a site. Um, so Design and Violence went online in uh, October of 2013. 
And each week, uh, we would post a new post and bring a new writer into the conversation. <coughs> Paola can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And it was, um, the idea was then to open each week up to uh, whomever uh, wanted to comment on these things. We felt that the comments were almost in some ways as important in the dialogue, the conversation was almost as important as the things we were posting themselves because we did want to, in a sense, foment and catalyze the difficult conversations we felt that the, the design community needed to have. So you can see here the ambiguity, the ambiguity that is so important. Look at the center top, technicals, the Toyota 4x4, uh, never meant to become guerrilla and uh, terrorists and, uh, and warfare vehicle, but it's become that way. And I mean, Forma remembers, she's a great writer, and uh, she remembers when it used to be the symbol of uh, farmers going into the fields, and now it's become the symbol of soldiers and the symbol of danger. Or bottom center, the Halden prison in Norway, where Peter Opsvik is uh, the, the, the man who committed the murder of like 80 plus people in the island near Oslo, where he is held, which is considered almost like a luxury prison. So every week we would publish and every week we would argue. You see the box cutter that is considered the symbol of 9-11. It is alleged that the terrorists uh, were able to take control of the flights uh, of the aircraft by using even though nobody knows if it's true, it's alleged so. Or the, uh, the Liberator gun itself, not to mention the stiletto heel. So you can tell there's a very wide range of different objects. Some of these objects are represented here, like the AK-47 or the female genital mutilation posters that were quite amazing. So, Every single one of these posts had a small curatorial introduction, the essay, and we were lucky enough as to have, at least at the beginning, well, throughout, but mm. at the beginning especially, some really uh, well-known writers like, you know, William Gibson, the science fiction writer, or Ariana Huffington, and that created this avalanche. We were able to count on really amazing people. The last post was in May of uh, last year, and it was about the lethal injection, and you know, you have Kevorkian's suicide machine here, the Thanatron, but we were actually talking about the design of the lethal injection in the United States, and the commentator was a man that had been for more than 30 years on death row, even though he was innocent, and he was finally released. So you can tell the um, importance of uh, having the opportunity to talk about these topics, even if you are or when you are in an institution as powerful and as well known as the Museum of Modern Art. What if museums could really harness their reach to talk about the most important topics that face a society today? That was our dream. In wonderful post-digital process, it so happened that our friendship, a pre-existing friendship with the Science Gallery led the director at that time of Science Gallery International, Michael John Gorman, uh, together with Lynn Scarf, to talk to us about having a show here at Science Gallery Dublin. To make a long story short, Ian has already told you about Lynn, about Ralph, and we're here because our dream has come true. We have been able not only to see the exhibition realized in physical world with more than three quarters new objects, therefore an interpretation that is exquisitely Dubliner and from Ireland, but also we've been able to see the platform grow. We are dreaming to be able to do exhibitions that are just the beginning. That we're dreaming to, uh, to initiate projects that then fe fester and grow in the world with different viewpoints and different voices that are heard. And we cannot think of a better place than the Science Gallery Dublin that is so used to dealing with people. So after this small introduction, yeah, I kept it, then got to a quarter of an hour. There's more <laughs> slides if we want them too, but um, we can start having a real conversation, Mr. Moderator. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's a, a, an amazing and also uh, a flattering kind of uh, introduction to this all. And like I said, it's, it's wonderful to be on the stage and have design and violence finally become a reality. Um, <coughs> what I will say is, you know, there's an amazing amount of diversity, both in what, you know, the online objects they've chosen and what we have in the show here. Uh, but I was listening to some conversations of what came up last night. Uh, and things like the AK-47, the Liberator, the connection to design and violence is, is, is I think obvious to everyone and upfront, but there are things like there's a chair and there's a Bitcoin miner and there are things which uh, have a little bit of a different or maybe a more 
uh, broad relationship to design and violence. Could, could you guys talk a little bit about the criteria that you applied to selecting things for the show, both online and for this show, and maybe when you decided something should be or shouldn't be in the show? How is it designed and how is it violence? Do you want to talk about the online and then Ralph can talk about the physical? Sure. Um, for the online, we were really looking to bring in a range of possibilities and, and ignore the obvious um, and really think about the subtle ways in which uh, violence was shifting and mutating. I think that was a bit of our response to Steven Pinker's argument about the forms of violence, that yes, in terms of, you know, sort of uh, people, you know, beating their spouses, that happens less frequently, thank goodness. But uh, one of the things, you know, we learned, I think, from the 1960s was that um, violence takes lots of strange forms. Language can be a form of violence. Um, laws can be a form of violence ultimately and they're overturned for those reasons. State power is obviously a form of violence and so we were really interested to see how those mutating, shape-shifting forms of violence uh, were making their ways into the everyday objects as well, not just into guns and, and weapons but into chairs and into uh, even new technologies like uh, Bitcoin mining. So it was really with a, a kind of uh, open mind and an attempt to to provoke and to not necessarily move to the most obvious, but in some cases to the least obvious, that we were sort of sorting through the projects. And one of the, one of the really interesting things, one of the interesting affordances of an online exhibition, which is very different from a sort of gallery um, exhibition, is that we were able to really grow, adapt, and learn over time. So what we released those first few weeks and what was on our checklist for those first few weeks um, and what we were imagining coming up really actually changed dramatically as we started to get feedback through the site, as we started to hear more about the kinds of things we were showing and weren't showing. Uh, we tended in the beginning, I think, to focus perhaps a bit too much on what we might call speculative or critical design artifacts, that is, things that raise very important questions about design um, and violence, but really almost in the abstract, sort of one degree removed from them. Um, and we, I think we both felt that there was a need to really engage with the, the, you know, the people who were on the front lines of this form of violence. And so we were able, slowly over the course of the 18 months, to start to bring in more voices, especially from outside, um, who had in many instances been the target of violence, um, who had been the victims of violence. And so for us, I think that was an opportunity to really change the conversation a bit more, engage with the stakes of violence a bit more directly. I don't know if you have thoughts in terms of Just one, you, you said it perfectly, I just want to add something. Um, in some cases, the object didn't come first. In some cases, we wanted to talk about a particular topic and we went crazy to find the design object. Mm -hmm. The lethal injection is an example. We yeah. wanted to talk about the death penalty, but it's not very easy to talk about the death penalty and design without resorting to either the gurney or the gas chamber, which seemed way too ham-handed. So by choosing the cocktail for the lethal injection, we kind of stretched the definition of what design is to an extent that you know is kind of a po poetic, sadly poetic license in a website, but maybe would be less so in an exhibition. But Thank Ralph. You. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think similarly, we <coughs> also sometimes uh, sometimes work from the object and sometimes from the issue, trying to mm. find the piece for it. Yeah. But I think something that was uh, apparent from the start about the theme of violence is that we wanted to be sure to locate violence in everyday life mm. and not just to see violence as spectacular examples of car bombs or explosions or crime or all of these things that appear to be violent. Um, I think people have commented that defining violence is actually trickier than it seems because rather than seeing those incidents of warfare or crime as being aberrations from the normal, you could actually see them as expressions of the normal that, that erupt. So all of, all of us are involved in networks of violence in one way or another, if you look at state power, for example. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to have a really broad definition that is quite political, really. It's looking at you know, economic inequality as a, as a form of violence and gender uh, sort of inequality, inequality, all of those kinds of things. So, Sorry, just one, uh, just one example to maybe illustrate some of this is uh, one of my favorite pieces on the show is Tembenkosi Goniwe's Dignities, which is a portrait of Tembenkosi who went to my art school um, and his painting lecturer. And it's uh, portraits of them side by side, each wearing a so-called flesh-colored plaster on their cheek. Uh, Tembi is black and his painting lecturer is white. 
and the work is titled Dignities. And you can see the stark contrast between how this plaster looks on a white face versus on a black face and the effect it has on the wearer. And I thought it's a really good work because it both shows this sort of superficial or direct relationship to violence of a plaster as something that covers an injury, but it also refers to this long-standing violence of racial uh, injustice or racial inequality. Um, and the artwork does a really good job of showing how something simple like a plaster uh, contains these, uh, these associations with violence. And I think that's maybe something we could also mm. mention is how art features on the show because um, some of our work is objects, designed objects that are displayed mm. with a commentary, and some of them are artworks where the artist has provided the commentary as an integral part of the work. Mm. And I think it was great to have that freedom here to use art as a medium for communicating the issues. Yeah, Ralph, you also mentioned the everyday nature that you wanted to tap into, and I think mm. in, your, in your essay, in the first sort of uh, publication that we yeah. have for Design Violence, uh, you talk about kind of uh, how personal experience and personal background have mm. influenced kind of your involvement in the show. Do you want yeah. to talk about that? Yeah. Well, for both themes, actually, both for design and for violence. I mean, so, so with design, I've, I've been interested in design for a very long time. I went to art school and um, I'm a sculptor, but I, I, I've always used synthetic processes and been interested in functional art. Um, and I've, you know, designed album covers and flyers and bars and events and uh, all kinds of things. But because my training is as an artist, I think it gives me a kind of critical perspective or a critical freedom. So I'm often looking at um, subverting that idea of design as just being functional, or, and I'm also definitely interested in deflating the idea that uh, design is a, a magic bullet, you know, like a silver bullet, like a solver of problems. So uh, my PhD was looking at a kind of taking a critical look at design for the developing world and seeing what's really going on with these wonderful sounding inventions and how well they actually work. So design, long-standing relationship, and this theme was perfect for that. Um, and then violence, actually in a very personal way, I grew up in, a, in South Africa during apartheid. So uh, from an early age, I was brought up uh, supporting the armed struggle in South Africa and in Zimbabwe, which was just to the north of us. And I, my family moved to Zimbabwe after it became independent in 1980. So I guess my attitudes towards violence from when I was a child were to see it as, to recognize both the sort of oppressive nature of the state's violence against dissidents, but also to see this, I guess, a romantic idea of violence as a means to change circumstances and a means to achieve liberty. And those, that's a very provocative combination. And I think in some ways I've spent a lot of my life looking at that issue, is like how do you how do you capture or acknowledge both of those natures mm. of violence? And so again, this show was a kind of a perfect platform for exploring some of those ideas. Yeah, they really came up actually in a lot of the pieces that we discussed uh, around very similar pieces and similar designs, uh, depending on who they were used by, mm. were tools of oppression or tools to fight against oppression. Yeah. Mm. Um, the flechettes in particular, uh, which you kind of that are not that far from a nail bomb, essentially. Exactly, yeah. What, what, how do we evaluate something differently, whether it's packaged as a kind of clinical state munition versus a homemade improvised mm -hmm. device? And the effect on you is the same of a nail bomb or a flechette cluster, but uh, they probably get appraised differently. And we want to sort of unpack some of those issues. Um, that wasn't probably the, I mean, that was a, quite a dark piece, but that wasn't yeah. the most controversial, I think, in our discussions internally. I know, Lynn, we had a lot of discussions about a lot of different pieces that were uh, intense about how how is it responsible to to exhibit this or uh, what's the right way to to do justice to this piece? Um, like anyone, did you find any particular pieces very difficult in the process of discussing uh, how they would be exhibited either online or in the show here? I mean, I I, I suppose you know. From, from my, and, and sort of my position within the kind of curatorial team is very much coming at it from the point of view of what Science Gallery does and what we're about as a, as a cultural space. And design and violence for me, I mean, apart from just you know, having seen the work that had been, that had developed online and, and being incredibly excited about the opportunity to work with Jamer and Paola and, and Ralph again, um, it was also about the science gallery, we have a huge amount of freedom in science gallery, which is quite unique to cultural spaces. Part of that is to do with our location, university, and, and the freedoms that come with that. But, 
but it allows us to tackle subjects like this perhaps in ways that other cultural organizations aren't able to. And I suppose from my perspective, I really wanted us to, to bring this, this exhibit to a, to a broad audience, which we have in Science Gallery, because, because we are this mixture of, of, of disciplines. Um, you know, science can, can be inaccessible to people. It can seem elitist. Art can seem elitist to people. Design can seem very elitist to people. There's, there's a danger there that Science Gallery could be like elitist cubed, actually, <laughs> if we didn't do things <laughs> properly. Um, so, so I suppose, but actually what we're constantly trying to do is to use that transdisciplinary nature to, not, to, to, to do the opposite. Um, and, and that's the piece around design and violence. So to answer Ian's question about the, the trickiness around, uh, around different pieces, all of these pieces we discussed, and some were more prolonged uh, amongst the curatorial team, but I think what, what became apparent, and I think for me what speaks to the exhibition, is that from a curatorial perspective, the more and more we talked and discussed things, and as trust builds with people as you work with them, the easier it became to talk about tricky, thorny issues. And what became apparent to me and what I, I wanted to happen in the exhibition space was to recreate almost that curatorial experience that we had as a small group for, for a broader audience, if you like. So to, to, to recreate a space where literally the com just the sheer talking backwards and forwards and discussing of something made, made, it, made it easier to actually think about it uh, in, a, in a broader context. And, and I, I hope that we've done that. I think the, the archive space where we're inviting our visitors to effectively curate the exhibition is, is really where we're hoping that that will happen. Um, you know, I mean, you know, we have the Eighth Amendment in the show and most of this audience will be aware of, you know, recent kind of, you know, issues in, in Project Theatre and, and, and Macer's um, uh, uh, work there that was removed. and. So we discussed a lot about having that in, in the show. Um, you know, we, we have the repeal jumper in the show. We have, you know, a series of firearms in the show. And our target audience is 15 to 25 year olds. So we have a lot of secondary schools and young students that's 15 to 19 makes up 30% of our audience. So, you know, there's a lot of kind of questions that we had to ask there. And, and but I feel that, that we've done that. And I'm very, I'm very confident about about how the show is going to be received and how people will respond to us. What, I mean, what was the reception like online? Did you have any pieces oh, that blew yeah, up? We, like had, we had a really funny thing happen. It was not censorship. I mean, every object was um, excitingly difficult. You know, it's like mm. we were really so happy and we stood by, I think, every... We, we never censored ourselves. There was one issue. When MoMA had decided that the site would live on the MoMA website, because so from WordPress, I mean, it remained on WordPress, but it became MoMA. Um, Michelle Millar Fisher, who worked with us on the project, had this brilliant idea. So there is, um, of course, you probably know about Ted Cruz, who uh, ran for president for the Republican Party, and he was um, um, governor of Texas? No, no so senator. senator of Texas. Yeah. Anyway, he had uh, uh, passed a bill that was really, really tough on immigration, like a really bad, tough bill. Uh, there is an architect whose name is Teddy Cruz that lives in San Diego that's been working for whole his life on the issue of the border and immigration, right? So Michelle said, let's take the bill that Ted Cruz uh, drafted, let's treat it as a design object, and let's ask, let's ask Teddy Cruz to actually comment on it, which was fabulous, right? So Teddy wrote this amazing letter to Ted Cruz, and what happened is that I don't know what possessed me. I think I still have some sense of responsibility as an employee of MoMA. I said, you know what, let me check with general counsel to let them know what's going to happen. And I found out that there's a law, like a really strict law, that says that um, not-for-profit institutions are not allowed to openly lobby on bills in the United States, lest they lose their not-profit status. So I was about to bring down MoMA. <laughs> 
And so what I did, I said, okay, we're not publishing it, but I called Creative Time, which is a wonderful institution in New York City that always does very politically charged events. And they have a website that's called Artists Report, Creative Time Reports. So they published it there. So it didn't go, uh, it didn't go wasted at all. It was a fabulous, fabulous letter. But that was the only mm. instance that we had, mm. I think. Yeah. It is really, um, it's interesting to see on the, on the online version of the project as well, the, you know, sort of the, the measure of the number of comments over time and, and what are the projects that elicited a lot of public commentary versus what are the ones that went uh, somewhat silent. And sometimes it was circumstantial um, and you know, just the time of year or whatever. And other times, clearly, just certain things you know, uh, catalyzed an audience to, to really participate in. Uh, the starkest for me, um, there, were, there were two, um, two uh, well, one amazing debate around um, speculative and critical design. And I encourage you to, there's a post by John Thackera on design and violence um, about the Republic of Salivation project. And, and I encourage you to go read that. It's a wonderfully important um, conversation about sort of the politics of design. Um, but the more illustrative one to me that still haunts me, I think, um, in terms of the project was that uh, we posted uh, Temple Grandin's serpentine uh, ramp, which is a ramp that she designed for a more humane slaughter of cattle. Um, and to, to write on that, we brought in um, Ingrid Newkirk, who is the uh, director of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, one of the leading activist groups in the United States that were talking about uh, animal rights. And um, she wrote a, actually a quite poetic and beautiful piece, um, and uh, basically defending the ramp that, that if we're going to kill cattle, at least it's better to kill them humanely. Um, wow. <laughs> 150, over 150 comments. Um, and in fact, we did a debate um, about uh, about um, sort of the ethics of meat and um, a public debate at MoMA. And uh, there was a, a, a very, very charged crowd. Some of my students were there. They were, they actually said, those vegans are tough. <laughs> and, you know, like they didn't dare raise their hands because they were afraid of the sort of backlash from the vegans, who knew? Um, and, uh, but, so over 150 comments for a piece about um, killing animals. When we, when we posted the Ricky uh, Jackson piece, the, the one that dealt with, um, the uh, death penalty in the United States, written by someone who'd been on death row for 39, or who'd been, excuse me, in prison for 39 years, uh, on death row for some of those years. Um, you know, a, a really, I think, a stunning reflection upon the, the power and the, just the sort of toxicity of, of the death penalty. Um, we got two comments. <laughs> two comments. So you kill animals and you get 150, you kill humans and you get two. So interesting the way that that can reflect certain, I think, kind of biases and predispositions of what happens online. Um, and I think just, you know, certain groups are more motivated than others, let's say. Um, and so there was an interesting way in which this exploration in some ways took the temperature of the online community at different moments. And for that, I think it was really interesting. Um, I'll open up to questions in a minute, but I want to ask one more because um, there are a lot of uh, pieces in the show that have had unintended consequences of their design. And I think the critical or ethical or moral kind of evaluative lens that this exhibition puts in them um, kind of provokes that and provokes a discussion around it. What I want to ask is for designers, for um, researchers, and it's come up at Science Gallery, do you think, or what do you think is the, sta the status of um, designers considering ethics in their design, um, and in, in scientists in their research, do you think that's uh, taught well? Do you think that's inbuilt and people really uh, actively consider the ethics and the ramifications of what they're making, or do you think that's not done enough? Well, you're, you're the educator, and you too. I mean, yeah, I could comment, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, well, from my perspective, I think that in the area I looked at, design for the developing world, um, a problem in that arena is that there's not much space for <clears throat> for negative results. It's all about mm -hmm. emphasizing the positives of a project. And when you look at scenarios or you know, yeah, projecting scenarios of how something will be used, the tendency is to project positive scenarios and that helps to raise funds for the project. And in general, design has a very positivist language of let's be optimistic and let's look at how things will work out for the best and let's rally people behind it. 
And I think if there was more acknowledgement of negative outcomes uh, explicitly during projects, I think that would be very helpful. So maybe they could be set the task of imagine three negative outcomes of this project and you'd have to research it and demonstrate how it could have negative outputs. Um, I mean, this comes up in, say, even like medical publishing. There's a call for all medical studies results to be published, not just the ones that get the results that yeah. the mm. testers want, yeah. in which case you'd get a much broader picture of what works and what doesn't. So, yeah, across the board, I think this idea of being able to be negative uh, would be a good, a good thing. Yeah, there's an interesting, um, this has been a, a long obsession of mine, and um, there is, though, there's some interesting characteristics to the practice of design that are really distinctly different from other fields in some ways. And there is the risk that the, and, and this is a risk that's worth taking, but it's a risk nonetheless, that, you know, the, the reflection upon one's ethics, upon the politics of one's practice, can also be quite paralyzing for designers. Mm. Um, and so there is always, I see this in my students particularly, as they, as they become more aware of the impact of what they're doing, they become much more timid about the things that they do. And you might say on the one hand, that's a good thing. <laughs> Maybe a bit of timidity is just fine, um, uh, instead of hubris, let's say. Um, but nonetheless, there's a, there is a kind of delicate balance between the, the need and the imperative to think about one's actions and think about the consequences and to anticipate those consequences versus the need to let creativity sort of flow. Um, and so how, how we then think about when and where ethics comes in and, and politics comes into that conversation might be the interesting question for design because it might be at a different sort of phase and stage than it is for other fields. And I certainly, I always kind of make the analogy with public health that public health practitioners are you know, putting interventions into the world. They're changing practices, objects, systems. But they also have a robust, often kind of multidisciplinary team that then evaluates the effectiveness and assesses those practices. And I think that's something that perhaps we could draw upon. But it still is, you know, I, I worry about the kind of wet blanket effect. And on the other hand, the other part of me worries about the fact that we've let designers go unbridled for so long. Uh, maybe a wet blanket is the best thing. So it's like, you know, like all of these things, it's a it's a, it's a thorny issue, but I think that, um, I think we've got to think about what ethics looks like in the practice of design, not just apply it from the models that we mm -hmm. see elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, yeah, I, just, I mean, it's an interesting one from our perspective. We've, we've recently established our own ethics panel in Science Gallery, um, mm -hmm. and we're actually, well, not, you know, from a kind of particularly within the, the science center, science museum world, there's not a lot, well, actually from what our research, we're one of the few ones that hasn't. The reason we did it, which is quite interesting, is we run a lot of experiments and research through mm -hmm. Science Gallery. Yeah. And what we were finding was that as an organization, we, were, we had to direct our ethics applications through one discipline. So it was either yeah. a computer science piece yeah. of research, or it was a health piece of research, or it was biome, whatever. And we were getting um, this sense that perhaps if we put this application through this ethics panel, it was more likely to go through because that <laughs> ethics panel had a different kind of way. Of, and, and so what we thought was, well, uh, this isn't sound uh, <laughs> for us going forward. And, and so we established um, our own uh, cross-disciplinary ethics mm, panel. Okay. So it has journalists, medical professionals, you know, people from computer science. It's interesting because it, it, for us as an organization, it does mean that we have, we've, we've effectively kind of slowed down our own yeah, creative exactly. process, exactly, actually, yeah. in terms of our ability to kind of do things quickly and turn yeah. them around. But, but I actually feel that uh, for the organization as a whole, as long as we remain ref kind of re you know, reflect reflective about it, and it'll be good in the long yeah, run, but absolutely. I think it's, it's at the beginning. So, yeah. so it, while it's not exactly the same as what you're talking about with the students, it's, it's in that realm and yeah, maybe people have some more thoughts on it. Yeah, do we have any questions from the audience? We've got one down here uh, and maybe if we have a second mic, I think there's one up back at the corner. So, and well, there's one there as well. So uh, if you just wait for the mic, then people can hear you on the, uh, yeah, the live casting there. Just right Third here. row. Third row. No, oh, no, yeah. third row from the front. bottom, I'm sorry, from <laughs> down here. <laughs> Put your hands up. Um, no, it's just on just what you're talking about, not specifically a question. Uh, I feel like in that, at least within design, there's, we're having that conversation. It's kind of like it's, it's born out of kind of more liberal arts, and there's kind of ethics built into it. But I think 
the real coalface on that kind of ethics stuff is in, in the digital side, where you see mm. what's happening with like Mark Zuckerberg and censoring. And I feel like that's where that question really comes up, because I, I think Papanak, you know, wrote that book, what, 40 years ago. It's, right. it's been in, in play for a while, but yeah. on the digital side, it seems much more kind of they need to get their, their house in order a bit, because they're changing the world rapidly. You know, mm. I think that's mm. for me anyway. Very yeah. true. It's an, it's an actually just on that adapt, which is one of the big science centers here that works specifically in that digital area and they're developing algorithms for all kinds of things that I don't understand. So I'm not going to pretend to, to, <laughs> to explain it, but they've recently de developed a collaboration with ethicists to develop a program where as they develop their research, it, that it's going hand in hand in the whole. So it'd be interesting to see what comes out of that because it's very much in the realm that you're talking about. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it affects their their research process, right? Because it's a very beginning of project. But, but um, how, they're, how they're actually educated those people. Yeah, and how, like and, how, they're and how they're engaging and whether, you know. So. They're much more, I suppose, engineers and mathematicians and they're not uh. digital science people rather than, they, I suppose they lack that kind of art school side of design mm. and, and mm -hmm. maybe more, more, kind of, more kind of thinking about context rather than functionality. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I yeah, if I could comment on the on mentioning Papanek. Um, so for all of you, Victor Papanek, very influential designer who uh, advanced the idea of appropriate technology in the sixties and seventies, along with Schumacher. Um, mm -hmm. something I've looked at is the idea that their ideas were essentially corrupted in the in the decades that followed to be brought into um, businesses as, as usual. So the whole idea of social enterprises or design for development is a way of saying these initially radical ideas about how we could change the world through design can be absorbed without any sort of friction into capitalism. So I'd, I'd say that those thinkers are still pretty relevant if we went back and, and looked at them. Um, and then in terms of how things fit into commerce is probably a key question when you're talking about the digital realm as well. So if you, if you look from a science and technology studies perspective, uh, you could have this critical lens of saying uh, these technologies don't just develop with a life of their own, which is a popular idea that you know technology just keeps on getting more and more complex and s smaller or more available, whatever it is, that actually that's being driven by commerce. So it's not, it's not like we have no choice about that direction. It just appears that it's a natural force that's developing, but actually it isn't. Uh, I think we've got, was there a question up here? No? Yeah, and if there's another one, we can get you a mic beforehand. Uh, anybody else over here? No? Okay, all right, go ahead. This is just a brief question. This um, seems like a brilliant piece of work and really important, but I was kind of stunned that you considered, you know, not just the two comments on the death row, but also the 150 comments, to me, seems very small for something out of MoMA. Could you comment on the responses that you got? Sure. We, uh, because, of, because we wanted to um, avoid the trolling, we didn't advertise the website widely. It was not on the Facebook page. We just like spread the word around, let it grow organically via Twitter. And um, that's maybe why we had so many comments, because, of course, PETA had let its audience know, but at the same time, also people that were monitoring PETA found out about it. So I think that's why it's still it doesn't um, explain, it doesn't account for the only two comments about the death row, because um, about lethal injection, because that is quite universal. There is this problem uh, on social media and online in general. You tend to, um, to form your own tribe and follow your own tribe. You're not exposed to other opinions often enough. So you always have to account a little bit for it, and we kept it small on purpose. Still, I was surprised that nobody spoke out a little more um, openly. And I think there's a, there's a connection in some ways to the first question as well. Um, we also required people to submit their email addresses yeah. when, when ah, they commented, so that open. may have reduced the, uh, you know, put a barrier in. Um, and in part, that was to try and, um, you know, anticipate and, and protect the site a little bit from uh, people who were just going to start throwing up negative comments for, for the fun of it. Um, but it also is, um, you know, I think we're all learning collectively how to manage a kind of civil a digital space, um, and it's something that we have to figure out. When, when do you tighten down um, the you know the openings too small? When when are they big enough? Um, and 
it's an interesting, you know, I think it's an interesting moment um, in sort of public discourse, uh, inter, you know, globally, really. Uh, we, at the moment, have sort of the, the human equivalent of, of an internet troll running for high public office in the United States. <laughs> and it's, um, you know, it's hard not to make the connection between the, the, the kinds of behavior that are encouraged um, and not only the language and the approach of, of some of our people seeking public office, but also the people who are showing up on both sides of the political aisle, um, you know, with a kind of um, vitriol that is, you know, in my lifetime, pretty unprecedented publicly. Um, and when you then incorporate the kind of, um, not just cyberbullying, but the harassing and the death threats around things, you know, there are, there are women who cover sports, and if they ask a coach uh, in a major sports team a difficult question, they get death threats. Um, and, you know, just uh, the most hideous forms of behavior in some ways that, uh, you know, I think we, this is a new medium, and I think we're going to have to figure out the ways, if, if it makes sense, to, in some ways to pull back from the more libertarian notions of, of what is allowable um, and think about where, you know, public discourse is something, and civil public discourse is something we prize, and maybe the cat's already out of the bag, as they say, and we won't, we won't be able to put it back in, but um, there are you know, interesting ways in which the, the internet can afford or can uh, shape uh, public conversation. I think it's important for us to, to reflect on that, so thank you for that question. Do we have another question? Yeah, uh, one down here and one over there. Just keep your hand up so she can, there we go. Really interesting discussion. I actually just happened to ramble in here and um, <laughs> just really enjoyed the last um, the minutes listening to you. I was just thinking about, I was watching a docu documentary recently, uh, David Attenborough, and looking at the ways humans kind of, or animals display violence. And have you kind of considered that kind of natural sort of tendency for hierarchy? And then this a second point is around the kind of paradoxical nature of uh, violence as being a form of oppression and then also sort of it can be sort of creating uh, more liberty. And then just thinking about that, my thoughts were, is there always going to be, say, if one your one force is kind of looking at, do you know, like, is it all, what's the solution in it? Is, have you thought about kind of solution to it? Because if you're stepping over in one way, then are you forcing ideas onto somebody else? I don't know if that makes sense, but if, say, for example, you're looking at a particular issue around um, gender or something, like, if you end up doing something about that, is that going to then affect, say, other kind of issues in society that you're not looking at that or if you look at for example insects and things like that um, if you got rid of say locusts there's going to be some other thing coming up does that make sense mm -hmm. definitely uh, yeah well just the first thing that you were saying about animals and humans and I think asking the question of are you uh, are we innately violent is one of I think is one facet of what you're asking yeah. So I think that's a very deep question, and I think that it is, um, I like to see those kinds of questions as not answerable questions necessarily, but as one of the big questions that, that humans face. It's, for example, also the tension between individuals and society. How do we resolve that? We, we don't really resolve it, but we find different ways to deal with it. Humans do have a propensity for violence, but they also have a propensity for compassion and for generosity and for peace. So I think the way that you read events you can look for the tendency towards violence, or you can also look to how difficult people find it to be violent. You know, the consequences of violence are severe. I mean, I think more US soldiers die from committing suicide than they die in combat at the moment, in terms of, of how warfare works. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd encourage that to be a question which you hold in your mind as a question, and then you see all the ways in which that can be explored, rather than something that you'd arrive at an answer to. And similarly, I don't, we're probably not looking to solve issues so much as we are looking to give people material to think through those issues. Mm. Regarding mm. the issue of uh, violence, 
<clears throat> gaining liberty versus violence oppressing. The last public debate that we had at MoMA, we, we had this cycle of public debates, Oxford-style debates with two, uh, with two debaters, a motion and a moderator. The last one was about the freedom on the internet, how to keep the internet free. And the two people arguing um, were Larry Lessig and Biela Coleman, two outstanding scholars. And uh, Larry Lessig was arguing um, for legislation, saying we have a shitty government. He didn't use the word shitty, but still it's a government and we need to legislate. And Biela Coleman instead was completely for civil disobedience. So um, the two were juxtaposing this kind of, you could say that civil disobedience is violent. It's a good violence in most cases, but it's a violence versus um, a, a system, a legislative system that Larry Lessig was upholding. So that was a very interesting um, formulation and discussion over this particular principle that you might still find online if you want on the design and violence side. I might just add there was an interesting editorial I read uh, a few weeks back and I can't remember the exact topic but um, it may have been sort of about uh, public discourse but the, the author brought up the point um, that we have a philosophy of just war for instance uh, that goes back a long time and that we've been able to develop uh, historically, and maybe it's probably more historically in the Western world, um, some consensus about what just war is and what the rules of engagement are around warfare. And so if we can collectively and uh, sort of through consensus build notions about uh, the fact that war will happen, can happen, but there are sort of rules of engagement for those, then we can probably figure out some of these other things, uh, you know, that are less devastating but still um, uh, cause real pain and suffering. Um, and so I, I sort of looked at that. We have actually tools and we have traditions for thinking through some of the most difficult problems around what constitutes, and we have conventions, Geneva Conventions, et cetera, around that. And so I think we also can look to those things for models and lessons about the ways in which people can come together who may sit on opposite sides of issues and, but still find a way to, to come up with tools for, for not surfacing the worst of our behavior. I've got time for maybe one or two more. I think there's one here and one here. Okay. Anya, if you want to pass the mic to this guy, we'll take him next. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks for such an interesting um, discussion. I would love to know the panel's thoughts on ideas about violence and creativity and places where there are wars and things. I'm thinking about in Belfast and Derry and the kind of creativity that comes out of places where there's an awful lot of violence and chaos versus the idea that I, I personally think that you need calm to be able to be creative. But I. That's just me, so I don't know. Um, I'd just like to know what the panel's thoughts on that idea of that link, like Marinetti or somebody like that, saying mm -hmm. you need violence to for that creative force to happen. Yeah, mm. Think, I've been thinking about it a lot, also on a personal basis, because. My husband argues that I do my best work only when I'm fighting with somebody, <laughs> and it might be true. But I don't know what's romantic and what's real, you know? So I like to look at places of conflict, and I like the art that comes out of those places. It's an art that is filled with strength, that it's fill, filled with despair, and that also is filled with the elan and the energy that is needed to lift a society from dire situations. But am I being romantic? Wouldn't it be better for these people if they were in a serene situation and their art were less, um, were, were less incisive? On the other hand, I feel that, um, and, and I'm getting very ex existentialistic here, but I feel that for most people, life is complicated. For some people, it's really, really, really hard. And because we need compassion, finding the kind of sympathy that comes from these artistic and creative expression is probably soothing, energizing, lifting, important for us to 
proceed as a society. So the idea that even design is an act of creative destruction is something that also Jamer kept repeating at the beginning when we were having these discussions. I think we should hold on to this notion and be aware that sometimes it might be romanticizing. You know, we try really not to aestheticize violence in, in our project and, and we don't want to romanticize it either. But for some, myself included, anger and violence are vital <laughs> energies. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'd answer in two, in two ways. One of them is looking at the place of violence in art. So, so I think especially music. I think music is such a rich field to look at, at this expression. Mm -hmm. So if you look at noise music or punk or hardcore or death metal or lots of different kinds of music forms that have a very violent intensity, they're cathartic and uh, they don't necessarily translate into real violence in terms of harming other people, uh, maybe on its fringes, but really it's about violence of expression um, and it can actually be, uh, can actually induce solidarity amongst people rather than divisiveness. Um, and then also about the role of art in violent situations, there's a, there's a documentary called A Revolution in Four-Part Harmony, which is about the role of music in South Africa's struggle against apartheid. Mm -hmm. So music was a very strong motivating force within that struggle, and so was graphic design and art. So I think definitely art uh, does come out of violent places, but uh, as uh, Paolo was indicating, I think that doesn't mean we should valorize it either. I think that we would also make beautiful art in a very peaceful, harmonious society as well. I don't know that we necessarily need actual violence. <laughs> no, yeah, because I think I, uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think that, but uh, but I think we can find friction and violence mm. in this very broad way, even within peacetime. There's does, a beautiful yeah. essay in praise of boredom. I think it's Susan Sontag. I don't remember yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just I wanted think, to know. I mean, it's quite interesting because I think it, it, creativity often comes from a moment where two things are juxtaposed against each other, and it causes. So you know. It's slightly different from that violence conversation. I mean, in many respects, a lot of the work that we see in science gallery is collaborative practice, and it's collaborative practice that comes where two disciplines are slamming in against each other. And that, that kind of interstitial zone between those two areas maybe in some respects acts in the same way as what, what Paola and, and Ralph are talking about in terms of, of violence. It's, it's, it's certainly very different, but this, this, those spaces, I think, can also be very fruitful creative spaces that where, where different ideas and, and disciplines are meeting and people are presenting those and discussing those. So maybe that's a slightly different take. This, this, this gallery is a, a space for that. Yeah. Science and yeah, yeah. Where science and art collide. Indeed, yeah. that is our <laughs> fight. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I was hoping to get the name. Uh, we got time there. for one last question, uh, I think, uh, and then uh, we'll have to leave it there. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just um, at the end of your conversation earlier, you were saying about how design should look at uh, the positives and the negatives of the outcomes of whatever it produces. I'm just wondering if that's a convenient way to push the responsibility of people's actions onto, away from where it should be to an industry of design where it's pretty much an impossible task because yes, you're making guns, but as you also alluded to, you're making chairs and band-aids and it's very hard to know what the negative outcome could be for making something. And violence can also come from things as you also alluded to, such as words and actions. Mm. So is doing that not going away from the real question of you know, why is the violence and does that not then go down the road of, well, they say the source of violence comes from fear, as I understand it. And as Chris Hadfield said recently, there's no reason to be, there's no reason for fear. Fear is just a lack of understanding. And then if you look at the likes of Carl Rogers and Carl Jung, from my understanding of them, they're saying that a lot of fear there comes from the lack of understanding of self. So is the focus not more on violence? And then the answer to that is to look at oneself and understand one's own fears, uh, or understanding the self, basically. Uh, and is that not what we should be looking at in terms of helping people understand their feelings and emotions to know how to deal with those as opposed to acting out or acting in? Yeah, it's a good question about responsibility, I suppose. Hmm. Um, I know, you were the one Ralph, talking you, about you, the you negative. Right negative. To you. Yes, yeah, you're right. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm just sort of digesting what you said and I'm thinking um, at the beginning where you said where it should really lie, responsibility, you mean, what do you mean by where it should really lie? 
Well, it's not, doesn't it like the actions of an individual, like the responsibility of an individual, which comes from our own definition of the word maturity, which is being responsible for your thoughts mm. and actions? Yeah. Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, but uh, I think that it's also that you shouldn't look at design as a neutral discipline. You know, I think the or the process of designing. I mean, design is informed by ideology, and uh, when you design an object, it will it will contain the ideology of the society that came from or of the designer, and it will act on society in a way that would be partly predicted and partly not predicted. Um, I mean, if we take, for example, something that was on the MoMA show, which was the IR8 Miracle Rice piece, mm -hmm. which is just outside this wall here, and we've reproduced it. It's about the green revolution, which is the idea that you can breed or genetically modify plants to be more productive, and so you can help to feed the world. So that was the premise for, for why this rice was developed. But and this is a very live issue because right now there's very similar things are happening in terms of trying to you golden know use rice. yeah golden yeah. rice create new forms of high high um, vitamin rice, but there were many unintended consequences of that act. Um, you, you got much higher rice yields immediately, but over time those started to drop off, um, and uh, now we're able to evaluate over time over decades what is the overall productivity whether you're using these modified uh, species or whether you were to use older, um, more sympathetic forms of, of agriculture. And in fact, they may even just like be le may, may level out. You get like a big boom and then you get a slump or you get this slow, more like sustainable growth. Um, so when that, that was a designed approach to how to feed the world, which had a consequence of depleting the land, also changing the face of labor and actually changing the geopolitics of that whole region. Um, that's partly unpredicted, but it also was partly predictable in terms of who the forces were who were uh, putting this program into place and what their motivations were in terms of, uh, let's say, politics. So I think I'm giving you a sort of a meandering response, but what I mean is I, I don't think that those areas are mutually exclusive. I don't think you can just look to individuals in a society and say it's up to each individual's actions or, con or conscience, consciences. Uh, because there are forces in society that um, influence how people see things and what their mm. actions are, and also all the professions and how they manage to put their program into place also bear responsibility for their actions as well. So I guess I think it's quite a complex picture, and it, it's probably not at one end of the spectrum or the other. It's probably a combination of those things. Can I just yeah. might quickly add, um, uh, what was unsaid in the Victor Papanek quote, um, is that the, um, the industry that he thought was uh, more violent than industrial design was advertising. <laughs> um, mm. it, uh, but you ask a really profound question, and I think the, what I see is that the, the opportunity for design and violence was not to become the entire conversation for designers and what they talk about, but to make it part of the conversation. Um, I think both Powell and I felt as though the conversation was too uh, frequently absent entirely um, in how designers interacted, what they did when they got together, how they were educated, how they thought about their work. Even if you just think about it from a sort of environmental standpoint, there's no question that, that professionally, institutionally, design has had a major impact in a lot of the environmental um, calamities that we're now facing. And so the point is not to say that we need to all put down everything we're doing and, and go through the the very difficult questions that we're trying to raise here, but that at least needs to be part of the conversation, that we need to open the space for that conversation to be able to happen. And to your point, you know, I think it is critical. There is a kind of self-reflection that needs to happen in this process, and I hope that um, you know, through design and violence and through the ways I've been using that in teaching, for instance, with designers who are sort of up and coming, um, is to just open a space of reflection, both on the self, but also on the industry, on the practice, on the profession. Um, so that we can engage with these issues, not be paralyzed by them, but move forward with more thoughtfulness about them. I think that profound question is where we're going to have to leave it for now. If you have uh, a question we didn't get to, feel free to come down here uh, afterwards. But uh, thank you to everyone who came along. Please uh, take some time to look at the exhibition, but let's finish with giving our uh, curators and panelists a big round of applause. <laughs>